whatever your troubles might be, are completely wiped away for a few seconds, and it's only about the wave, and it's only about making it, and it's, it's about life, you know? It's about really feeling alive for a few minutes. Fear, danger, excitement, our most primal urges. They draw us like moths to a flame. They urge us to fight and flee, attack and achieve, survive and succeed, providing the inspiration to push us to our physical limits. The Hawaiian islands of Maui and Oahu are the birthplace of surfing. Watch as we hook up with the biggest of big wave surfers on the one and only Jaws. See the best of Maui's incredible windsurfers and check out kite surfing and its current top dog. If that's not enough, we'll be mountain boarding with the sports innovators, shaping surfboards, riding waves with the pros, and hanging with the most soulful of Hawaiian surf families. We'll also jet from the islands to check out river surfing in Jackson Hole, Wyoming and surfing the big mountains of Valdez, Alaska. Today's athletes flirt with danger and constantly push their personal limits to feel the pure, clean rush of adrenaline. This is the rush we all seek and crave. So give in and let yourself be taken to the limit. This is Paia, the mellow part of Maui. Relaxed and less crowded than the rest of the popular island, Paia is home to some of the most radical water athletes in the world. Famous breaks like Ho'okipa serve as the training grounds for some of the world's best watermen. From their paddle surfing to their windsurfing, kite surfing, and their amazing toe wind surfing, Maui is the place for a group of adventurers who want it all. Pete Cabrina and Dave Kalama are two veteran athletes intimately familiar with Paia's pleasures and its wrath. I don't really consider myself more of anything. I'm just, I kind of go with the conditions, more or less, you know, the wind's blowing really hard. Go windsurfing that day. If it's no, no waves and it's good wind, then go kite surfing. If the surf's really good and it's glassy, then go out surfing or longboarding. If it's big, then you go towing, you know, just, Kind of whatever the day dictates, whatever's best. A really good day to me is a day where I feel really, really good, confident, strong, balanced, in tune with everything, and have the conditions good, which is sometimes a rare thing. For those to come together and then to have a day where you feel good and you're on and you're surfing, you know, can really make it memorable. It's more artistic, it's a little bit more creative. You draw your own lines, nobody tells you how to do it, nobody tells you the right way. You can just stand up and go straight down the wave or you could do 50 turns on the wave and it, it's all good, it all works. That's what I love about surfing and windsurfing and everything else that we do is that it's, it's all more creative and more artistic. Paia is truly home to Pete. From his window, he can see the waves he loves. This is it, this is my own little slice of paradise. I don't want to live anywhere else. This is Haiku, and uh, just out past those trees right in the ocean is uh, where Jaws is at. And uh, this valley sort of ends up right out, outside near Jaws. So when it's really big and the waves are breaking outside at Jaws, the sound comes up the valley and pretty much shakes the house. I mean, when it's breaking, you don't get much sleep because you know you can hear that rumble of the waves and you know, it's pounding all night long and you know it's big. We call it Piahi just because we live here and it sort of gives respect to the, the, the area that it's located. Jaws is, you know, 
it's the, the Hollywood name. It's some people like to call it that because it's a little bit more sensational. Jaws is okay. Yeah, he, whatever. <laughs> Just because Pete lives in the midst of such timeless beauty doesn't mean he can't take advantage of the very latest technology. Right from his home computer, Pete gets a sneak peek at what his surfing day is going to be like. Examining weather and patterns from a world away, Pete can track the weather and surf conditions, bringing the biggest and best surf to Jaws. I uh, just hook up uh, to the internet, and um, there's just a world of information out there about uh, surf forecasting and a lot of the stuff is detailed where you can just you know click on, onto a forecast and they'll tell you what it is but I kind of prefer to be an amateur meteorologist and try to figure it out myself. I mean it's almost to the point where if I knew I was going down to Fiji and I had an open ticket I could look on the net and just wait until the surf was going to be right and then just jam down there and catch the swell. The swells are caused by wind basically. You get a really strong storm and you get the wind blowing over one part of the water for any length of time. It creates these waves and right at the storm the waves are all just unruly and just sort of everywhere but the swells that we get in, in Hawaii usually come from about 2,000 miles away and so they travel across the Pacific for 2,000 miles and they start to collect with each other and line themselves up into these perfect like corduroy lines that just hit the shores of Hawaii. Fortunately, because we're 2,000 miles away, you know, Hawaii's in its own weather pattern that's completely different from that storm. So we could be where there's absolutely no, not a breath of wind, but we're getting the waves from that storm really far away. And that's the ideal scenario. As luck would have it, the surf making its way to Hawaii was some of the best that Pete has ever seen. This is a classic, classic scenario for surf in, in Hawaii. We've got this huge low. I mean, you can see it spans from the Kamchaka Peninsula and the Aleutian Islands almost all the way down to Hawaii. So that's just a gigantic low. Also, the other thing to look at is, is the reading. Um, in the center of the low, it's 968. That's pretty low. A classic storm, 968 is pretty good. But this is what we're looking at right here, and this is called the fetch. And that's pointing right at Hawaii. You can see it just, this is winds. That's got to be like a thousand miles just blowing in the same place over and over and over and if that low stayed there for a day or so you can imagine it's going to send a lot of waves to Hawaii which Hawaii is sitting over here in really nice weather you know it's there's a high pressure there's not that much wind so by the time the waves get to Hawaii they're all cleaned up and they're uh, they're really nice for surfing and that's what makes the North Shore of Hawaii world class We've all heard about catching the perfect wave. Some surfers travel all over the world searching for it. But what exactly is the perfect wave? How does it happen? To explain this phenomenon, a force of nature as ancient and unrelenting as the world itself, we asked Dave for an explanation. It's a wave of energy, so it's got the front slope, you know, isn't actually pushing water, it's just the energy that's traveling through the water. When a wave is traveling through deep water, it's traveling with no resistance. And it's traveling approximately at 25 miles an hour, give or take a few miles an hour, depending upon the strength of the storm, the size of the wave. But as it comes in next to an island or a reef, the more rapid the change between deep water to shallow water, the harder the wave will break. So if it's a nice gradual, change, it'll stand up slowly, it'll slow down a lot, and then it won't break as radically. But when it comes from deep water with a lot of speed and then hits a shallow reef, the reef essentially stops the bottom of the wave, but the top is still trying to go as fast as it was out in the deep water. And that's what will cause the wave to break real hard, and that's what happens a lot in the Hawaiian waves, and that's why they break so hard. That phenomenon right there is even accentuated even more at Piahi. Make no mistake, Dave knows the primal energy of every wave and every break, especially those around Jaws. Piahi gets so big basically because of the bottom shape. There's a real deep channel right next to a 
a reef that sticks up and gets fairly shallow from, from real deep water. And that helps to draw all the energy of the wave into that one point and focuses it right there so that when it breaks, it's almost like almost like doubling itself because it's drawing all the energy into one focal point. And that's, that's what helps it draw up so much and get so big and then throw out so far. It's the break where you see that line of alert and totally stoked surfers, carefully scanning the water for that perfect ride. It's all about timing. If you find yourself sitting too far out, the wave will pass right on by and you'll miss the break. But if you time it just right, you're in for the ride of a lifetime. Breaks come in a variety of forms. We'll explain a few. Shore breaks are the most common occurring every time the water meets the shore or beach. Normally the ocean floor develops a shelf as it moves closer to shore. The waves break against the shelf. Shore breaks are popular, but unpredictable. The ocean shelf is typically long and waves will break at different points along the way. If you're not in the right spot, at the right time, you'll miss it. Point breaks seem to be every hardcore surfer's favorite. They begin where the shore extends to a point further out in the ocean. The waves come in on an angle and get closer and closer to shore. As the regular wave, long and roughly parallel to shore, comes in, it hits the point break, which quickly travels the length of the wave as it approaches the shore. The result is a wave that breaks and peels off perfectly. Point breaks are the most predictable and can give you the longest ride. Coral reef breaks are usually the most spectacular. Famous waves like the Banzai Pipeline are the result of coral reefs just beneath the surface of the deep water. The depth of the water changes so quickly that the incoming wave is forced to break very hard, very fast, causing spectacularly steep and stunning, beautiful rollovers. Exciting, but dangerous. Landing on coral is not for the timid or the squeamish. Meet Dave Swanee Swanwick and Darian Boyle. These two adventure seekers will further our quest in search of the limit. When Dave Swanwick isn't pushing his personal limits in the mountains, he's traveling the world, meeting new people, and looking for new adventures. Darian Boyle is not your traditional sports girl. She's an adrenaline junkie, and she likes sports that push her limits. She loves the fear, the danger, and the excitement of living on the edge. And she likes to surround herself with people that do the same. Pete Cabrina's prediction of huge surf was right. Jaws, or payahi to the locals, was going off. Swanee and Darian were not about to miss seeing these world famous waves. Perfect conditions like these are very rare so they had to seize the day. The only roads to Jaws travel through demanding pineapple fields. It's four-wheel drive only out here, which keeps the crowds under control. Jaws has seen a huge upsurge in popularity recently. A few years ago, the crowd mostly consisted of surfers' wives and their kids, but now more and more people show up to see these monstrous waves ridden. Necessity is the mother of invention. And for hardcore surfers like these, riding bigger waves is definitely a necessity. In the quest for the bigger wave, the excitement of creative invention took over. Foot straps. Because we were going so fast, you needed to be connected to your board or else you'd just get bucked right off. Especially because Maui is such a windy island. A lot of times when it's big, it's bumpy, it's windy. So you definitely have to have the foot straps to stay on your board. The waves at Jaws are so big and dangerous and break so far out that surfers had to find a way to get to the wave without paddling into it. By utilizing jet skis and small speedboats, 
Toe-in surfing actually tows the bravest surfers into the path of the biggest waves. You go out there and you scare yourself to death, but you come in laughing. There's definitely a lot of fear involved. It's like that you know, thing of facing your fears, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of like standing, let's see how, how close we can stand next to this fire before you get burned. get hurt just from the the mass of water just coming over I mean it's probably I think somebody equated it to tipping a couple of Olympic sized swimming pools onto your head jaws will break about eight times a year it's surfable a little bit more than that but it'll break well about eight times a year they're all pretty memorable but like two or three that are just insane like it'll be over 20 feet insane maybe but when Jaws is going off, there's no feeling quite like it. It becomes a very exhilarating kind of a feeling to let your conscious mind take the back seat for just a moment because things are happening so fast that you wouldn't be able to keep up with them consciously. You know, and that's where natural skill and experience and practice and all of these things that you've uh, accumulated to that particular point come into play. It's a very freeing kind of cleansing experience because bills aren't in your mind, you know, taxes, whatever your troubles might be are completely wiped away for a few seconds and it's only about the wave and it's only about making it and it's, it's about life, you know, it's about really feeling alive for a few minutes and uh, that feeling can become very addictive and I think a lot of big wave surfers have felt that. I know they have. You can't help but feel it when you're on a big wave. Perhaps that's what ultimately draws us to all sports. Enthralled by the sheer power of the moment, your mind is inadvertently, temporarily free from the stresses of daily living. If euphoria is what you're looking for, it's hard to beat one wild ride on what amounts to the very pulse of the ocean. If you go out there with some attitude like it's something to be conquered or to be greater than, it's gonna swat you so bad and you're gonna just go crying back to your mom. When does confidence turn into reckless insanity? When does the absence of fear reveal not confidence, but someone who does not know any better? It's a fine line by the looks of things. Are there no limits? I think being scared out there is a good thing. It keeps everything in check, but at the same time, it produces whatever it is in your body, adrenaline or whatever, that sort of heightens your performance. I guess I haven't found my limit yet. One of these days I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna say, you know what, I'm not in the right mood, I'm not gonna surf today, but I guess that hasn't happened yet. When the consequences of one mistake can lead to death, it comes down to trusting your teammate with your life. It's scary being underwater because you're, you're in complete darkness. You're getting pulled and pushed and squished and spun and all of these things all at one second. It's a very intimidating feeling, but if you can just stay relaxed and keep your mind calm, you can make it out of it. That's what you're fighting the most is yourself, to stay calm. One of the most scary experiences for me is when somebody else is in trouble because I know they're down there and I know they're in trouble. And if they don't come up in time, I can't do anything about it. And that's really what scares me, and not being able to do something to help my teammate that might be in trouble. When push comes to shove, you know you got some guys that can really look after you. You know, when it gets big and, and you know, you're in the thick of it and you go down on a wave, you know, you've got a handful of guys that are totally skilled watermen, very close friends that will, you know, dive in there and go after you. 
and you know you do the same for them. When you tackle these waves of, of that magnitude, somebody's going to get hurt sooner or later. And if you're not prepared to, to deal with it, it could go from a really bad injury to a death. When that wave wants to thump you, it doesn't matter how strong or how good a team you have or what kind of rescue devices you have right there at arm's length. If you're not coming back up to the surface, nobody's going to be able to do anything for you. Swanee and Darian took a few side trips, exploring all that Maui has to offer. Along the way, they were witness to some true Hawaiian culture. The roots of toe windsurfing can be traced to windsurfing, but not the kind you watch on a pristine lake somewhere. This is the big time in more ways than one. These guys have figured out new ways to ride and beat the waves. We've already seen what happens to surfers when Jaws is big and smooth, but what happens when Jaws goes crazy and the wind is strong? This does. All of the big wave toe-in surfers, including Pete and Dave, started with and still love windsurfing. The foot strap came from windsurfing, which helped you jump and get air and get more control over the board. People have experimented with foot straps on surfboards in the past, but never really worked all the kinks out and stuck with it and figured out the best way to go about it. And I think our experience that we bring from the windsurfing side of it helped us come in with more knowledge about foot straps and how to use them and where to place them on a board and things of that nature. With a sail attached, Dave and his windsurfing buddies can not only catch waves, but ride over and above them. It's the perfect use of wind and water, but it takes practice to do it like this. Windsurfing is really a, really a good training tool for surfing, for toe surfing. The fact that you catch the waves so far out to sea is similar to toe surfing and judging the waves, how it's building, where it's going to break first, all of these different things that uh, are similar in toe surfing are also a big part of windsurfing. You know, every time I go out there I'm pushing it as hard as I can, trying to make up new moves, trying to master the ones I can already do. I sort of enjoy the soulful part of windsurfing more than the competitive part and just really enjoy the sport as a whole. And, what it has to offer. There are others on Maui that make windsurfing their passion and top priority. A couple of the most respected are Josh and Jason Stone. The waves were good, so Swanee and Darian had trouble getting them out of the water. But they finally managed to catch up with the Energetic Brothers in a moment of rest. Pro windsurfing is, is, is fairly new. I think all of these kind of extreme sports are pretty new. I hate to say extreme because it's kind of a strange way to describe a sport. But windsurfing is a, a really free sport. Like it, it deals with two elements in nature, wind and waves. And um, when you're doing it, it's, it you get this, uh, this feeling of being bigger than yourself. You know, you get this like power from it because you're out there, you're working with the elements and you're using these elements to just go further and higher than you could ever go. Growing up in Hawaii is it's probably the best place in the world you can grow up for windsurfing or surfing because the conditions are so excellent. I grew up right next door to Robbie Nash, who was the world champion at the time, so for me it was, it was really perfect kind of situation to get into the sport of windsurfing. And I think anybody in Hawaii definitely has an advantage over other people because every day is pretty much firing. I mean, we windsurf or surf pretty much every day. Of course, having a friend, let alone a brother, watching your back and sharing your fun is always a good thing. Together, the Stone Brothers just keep chasing their limits. Although Jason doesn't believe that things exist. We're always trying new stuff, me and my brother, and um, 
all the young guys, we pretty much just uh, go for it. And there's not really so much limits as it is, it's just like a really hard learning curve. <laughs> So like you'll, you'll hit a point where you don't think you can land something and you might call it a limit, but the next day someone will be landing it and there won't be a limit anymore. It'll be just like another hurdle to get over. You go higher and higher. And so it, it's kind of progressing. You know, there's never a set limit. It's more like a, kind of like a moving finish. I'm not hanging on to God. He's hanging on to me. Nobody is the best. There's always better. I mean, you can always get better than you are. And especially in the sport of windsurfing, the equipment is progressing so quickly that our limits keep advancing and advancing further and further. We're going higher and higher and doing more and more rotations in our loops and the wave riding's getting more vertical and more radical. With me, I haven't found my limits and I don't expect to ever find my limits. The Stone Brothers' energy rubbed off on Darian and she couldn't wait any longer to get in the water herself. So we're cruising down at Sprex, you know, and then we hooked up with Darren. She's like, I can windsurf, I can windsurf. I said, okay, cool, you know, go out on my stuff, lend her some stuff, and she went out there and ripped it up. The Stone Brothers, they're purists, soul sailors, and their passion of the sport comes through when they're sailing. I watched Darian for a while, and then I got anxious to try this sport myself. So I hooked up with local windsurfer CC Cleary. Even though I had never tried windsurfing, CC took on the challenge of getting me in the water. I figured, like all sports, that windsurfing is not as easy as these guys make it look. I got a ride or two. I won't be catching big air, but I'm psyched to get more wind under my belt. For the time being, I decided to hang out on the beach and watch CC for a while. I actually started windsurfing on a trip I was on in Baja. We had windsurfing rigs set up for 11 days straight. I could go out and just windsurf every day and learn. And I just got hooked. It was something about the feeling. It was the soul of it. Being so close to the water, the wind, the, the harsh conditions. Shortly after, within a year of that trip, I moved to Maui. I just moved here cold and just said, I'm going to be a windsurfer. Everyone thought I was nuts. From New York City, from the college I went to in Vermont, they thought I was crazy. I left with a better idea of what makes CC tick, and although it was rough duty, it was great to learn from one of the best windsurfers in the islands. The Hawaiian Islands are full of activities outside of surfing. Whether it's a gorgeous scenic helicopter tour, or snorkeling on one of the island's beautiful coral reefs, Hawaii remains one of the most untouched marine ecologies in the world. There is another connected sport you can find on Maui. You're on a board, you're sliding sideways, and you're strapped in. But it's not on the water, it's on the asphalt. No primal forces here. The sport is really easy to get a hang of, especially if you surf, snowboard, or skateboard. It's a lot of the same balance. It's amazing that so many of the sport's technical advances are taking place right here on Maui. We went to the shop of Brett Lickle, one of the strap team innovators and a guy who loves to experiment with new equipment to see where the sport of mountain boarding has been and where it's headed. Our company is B&G Engineering. This is Gerard Franco and I'm Brett Lickle. And uh, basically what we do is we produce and manufacture parts for the sports industry. One of Brett's innovations and a major advancement for the sport is a handbrake for mountain boards. It has also made the sport safer and more enjoyable for beginners. From there we worked on all kinds of things with the brakes. We did hydraulics in the beginning, then we went to basic V-brake, cantilever style brakes, keeping everything in the hand. I designed one for a foot brake and in actuality it's great fun to ride, but it, it kind of limits you to the performance level. With the hand brake everybody's used to it, so you can just activate it and it makes it so that the most basic person can jump on the board right from the start and go.
Brett showed us some of the other things they're working on. Mainly, new booms for kite surfing. Another new connected sport making huge strides here on Maui. Brett and the members of the strap team experimented with different kite techniques and helped develop the harness, which made the sport much easier. By allowing the kite surfer to be harnessed into the kite, instead of just holding it with their hands, they're able to perform maneuvers much more efficiently. The harness has opened everything up. The ability to, to harness the wind like you do on a windsurfer and basically you can fly the kite with two fingers and just enjoy yourself as opposed to in my first experiences, it was truly a grueling experience. Even though Brett and his friends are quickly gaining ground in the kite surfing world, there are a few people out there with a strictly kite surfing background. Brett told us about a guy nicknamed Flash, who is at the top of this new sport. You gotta realize Flash is the best at this point right now. After seeing this new equipment and hearing about this Flash character, Swanee and Darian headed straight to the beach to check it out. Flash said he'd show them a thing or two about kite surfing. He's the world champion and the best teacher around. I received the nickname Flash because when I started kite surfing, I'd fly by down the beach and people would barely catch a glimpse of me. And uh, so the nickname stuck, Flash. I see the potential of the kite surfing opening up a whole new world because it combines all kinds of sports like wakeboarding, kite flying, surfing, and windsurfing, and skiing into one. At any given point in time, the kite will pick you up 15, 20 feet up in the air. You'll just be going along and all of a sudden you'll get a gust of wind that'll just elevate you right up off the water and you'll maintain your course and speed and then all of a sudden it'll, it'll lower you back down to a nice soft landing. After watching Flash, it was Swanee and Darian's turn to give it a shot. I'm ready. I'm going to get so worked. It's going to be so exciting. Swanee looks like a dog catching a ball. <laughs> Mary Poppins, I'm going to show her up. With the unpredictable wind, our guides didn't get a chance to get on a board. Even with perfect conditions, we would have been lucky to get a real ride on our first day. I guess it shows you what a challenging sport kite surfing is and how much it is dependent on Mother Nature. Not unlike kite surfing, the sport of snowboarding has become incredibly popular in recent years. All-world snowboarder Jeremy Jones, who happens to be an excellent surfer as well, described to us the similarities and differences between the two sports. The feeling I get from snowboarding and surfing is very similar when it comes down to making turns, doing cutbacks and off the lips on a surfboard feel very similar to what it feels, you know, slashing wind lips and making big carves on a snowboard. But we wondered, what sport is more difficult? Snowboarding is more abusive on your body over time and when you're out in the backcountry every day and really pushing snowboarding to the edge you can get in over your head with avalanches and maybe not evaluate the snowpack correctly but on the same note surfing you know you get tumbled around a lot more and but it's water so it doesn't the injuries are less. Well, I think that snowboarding in Alaska has some similarities. Mainly, when you're out snowboarding in Alaska, you have a team, and if something goes wrong, you really count on your team. Towing surfing is similar to that. Those guys have been doing it 
all their life and you know tried to push surfing to new levels and it's been their main focus in life and that's the same with the people you're seeing pushing snowboarding to new levels in places like Alaska. It's not something that you can learn in five years. You need a lifetime of experience to really safely be pushing that stuff. So you're kind of harnessing this raw energy trying to take control of it and, and that's the funnest part is when you surf a wave perfectly or put a perfect line down a mountain face is that's really the the funnest part of both sports Jeremy has figured out one way to surf the mountain, but when the snow melts, it creates another way to surf, on the river. Every spring, snow melts from the mountains and causes rivers and streams to become raging flows of turbulent water. This brings out rafters and kayakers, but it also brings out a few rare surfing enthusiasts. Demian McConnell is a pro snowboarder who actually grew up in Hawaii. He just can't forget his love for surfing waves. Lucky for him, when the Wyoming conditions are right, Demian can surf a standing wave. It's kind of special to be on the river in the middle of the continent, so far from the ocean, riding a wave that lasts for hours if you'd like it to. It's like riding a little Malibu point break or something, the wave just goes and goes. It doesn't break all the time, but you get it probably two times in the summer and when it's on no one misses it because it's the only surf we have in Wyoming. Finally, we had arrived at the fabled mecca of surfing, the North Shore. sure to stop by the surfboard factory of Hawaiian board shaping legend Mike Wu. He showed off his skills by building custom boards for both Swanee and Darien. I haven't even shaped the board yet and I built the shaping room, bought my tools, invested $2,000 into just trying it out, seeing how I liked it. And it was like magic. I just made for it. Mike shaped boards especially for us, which he tailored to our own surfing styles. I surf a lot, so Mike made me a gun, which is a board used for surfing aggressively in big waves. I'm more of a beginner surfer, so he made me a board that'll be easy for me to get up on, but once I'm up, it's versatile enough that I can maneuver on the wave. After seeing all those surfboards just sitting there, it was time to see some true action on the North Shore. We met up with pro surfer Rochelle Ballard, a Hawaii native and a constant top three finisher on the Women's Pro Tour. Throughout the years, Rochelle has been witness to a surge in the popularity of women surfing. This last like three years, there's been such a huge, uh, just a uh, blossom, I guess you'd say, of, of women surfing to where uh, just there's so many girls that want to surf now, you know, it's like, I can't go anywhere and not see a girl out. It's like before, when I was growing up, I'd never see girls out surfing. Rochelle is known for her slashing, aggressive style but she pushes the limit of women surfing to new heights through her barrel riding, an aspect of surfing that has traditionally been set aside for the guys. One of, one of my main things is, is uh, barrels. I really want to push the um, level for women surfing in, in barrel riding, and, and there's, there's very few women that really know how to ride the barrel. It's just so intense, you know? You're in the core of the wave. You're in, you're in its, its energy 
um, nucleus. And uh, you can, they say you can make electricity out of, out of the uh, power that's in a barrel. It's like you're, you're in your own little world. It's like the lip comes over, it covers you, and you can't see anything else but that, that blue cylinder. It's driving forward, and you're trying to adjust to its speed, whether it's going to be a fast barrel, whether it's going to be a slower barrel. You know, in the slower barrel, you're like, OK, stall, you know, tuck my hand in and just slow down and just kind of stay with this thing, you know? And, and if it's a faster barrel, it's like, you're just, you're really driving. You're, you're really trying to gain your speed and, and pump your board so that you can get through it and make it out of it. And then there's the kind of barrels where you can just stand there and just, just go, yeah, you know, you're just like perfect speed. You don't have to do anything. You just stand there and just enjoy it. And then like at that last second, there's like this still in, in the air or in, inside of the wave. And then all of a sudden it just releases this massive, powerful spit at you and spit you out of the barrel. <laughs> it's a really good feeling. It's just real high, high um, intensity kind of a wave. It fills your body with so much energy. Um, it, it's a difficult, difficult wave to surf at the same time. I could be having like the worst surf ever, you know, just be like, ah, you know, I'm not having a good surf today, just whatever. And then all of a sudden, like, I'll get a sick barrel and get spat out, and I'll just be like, yeah, that was such an insane surf. <laughs> Just as Rochelle has revolutionized women's barrel riding, men's pro surfer Tim Curran has captured the attention of surfers everywhere with his radical aerials and his incredible agility. Tim's style is different from the big wave surfers, but his talent is not. Towing, surfing is a totally different sport to me. Uh, those guys are riding mountains. I'd probably drown out there. I don't know. That's totally different level of surfing. Surfing waves that big scares me to death, so I, I stick to a little bit smaller waves and more contest surfing, and I'm out there trying to ride medium-sized waves, but do as many turns as I can do and just have fun, and I feel that my surfing isn't life-threatening most of the time, so that's a little bit different. I started surfing when I was five years old, and uh, ever since I stood up on my first wave, I, my parents kind of keep me out of the water. My dad surfs, all my brothers surf, Josh and Nathaniel, and I have a four-year-old brother who's probably gonna start surfing pretty soon here. My uncle does videos, and my dad works and films on a few of the surf movies we've done, and we've got a, definitely a surf family. All of the Hawaiian Islands have a long surfing tradition. In the case of Oahu's Ben and Aquila Aipa, it's a tradition literally handed down from father to son. A professional surfer, Aquila has been surfing on Oahu ever since he could stand up. And he has always been thankful for the guidance of his father, legendary surfer and board shaper Ben Aipa. Aquila was nice enough to show off some of his favorite breaks on the North Shore to Swanee and Darien before father and son got together at their favorite beach, Haleiwa. It's a seven mile stretch that you pretty much find every wave on. You find the most intense ride in the world. You find a fun, playful ride and left. You find a, a beach break. You got Sunset, which is like a big, a premier big wave spot. You have Haleiwa, which is a high performance big wave spot. And you have like, it's a, you know, I have more waves here in seven miles and you could pretty much look in whole world. Just being at Haleiwa reminded Aquila and Ben of the past. Just, just being at Haleiwa today, it's funny to see all the little kids in the shore break because that's, that's where we started and that's pretty much us you know, 15 years ago. The smile coming out of the water, you know, the smile after finishing a wave, the smile him talking to somebody else in the water, you know, the, the on the beach after the, after the surfing, the smile, the talking, the, the whole happy feeling, you know? That's the thing. That's, that's what I enjoyed a lot. I get more excited now watching all this new kind of surfing. And for the age I am, I try to absorb what I see, you know? 
And I'm pretty sure like in other major sports where you have parents or older guys watching their kids, you know, they absorb it, but they cannot do it. They cannot go out and do it, you know. Well, I'm lucky enough that I can, I can join these guys and get involved in it. And join the guys he did. When he goes off or anything, you know, I get all pumped up. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> that's my boy. Woo. <laughs> I, I get the same way. I like, whoa, that's my dad. Oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's not every day that you get to paddle out and see your dad on a wave and he's actually ripping you. That's, <laughs> I just crack up. Well, here's the thing, you know, like when we go to, let's say, uh, a spot maybe in town, you know, all the bowls and you know, we're out there, we're surfing, you know, and guys see us out there and then, you know, there's a thing, you know, what's worse than one ipe on a wave, you know? Two. <laughs> I'm a senior citizen. Okay. <laughs> and uh I just got to be conscious of uh, what I do, what I eat, what I, you know, the whole thing. And it's basically, it's just keeping your body healthy. Whether you eat good or you exercise good, you know. And that's going to re just reward you, you know, in what you, you do, whether it's surfing or anything. You know, the biggest rewarding thing of all right now, you know, as I'm still surfing and all, it's just the enjoyment of surfing with my son, my daughter, his friends, you know, their friends, you know, people like you coming over, you know, that I don't even know, but it's enjoyable surfing with your people, you know. That's what it's all about for me. Like his father before him, Akila views surfing and the ocean as something much more profound than a sport. I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't look out the window and see the ocean, you know, I'd, it, it makes me feel like I have a foundation, I don't know, I, I mean, when I'm in the city and these grids, I, I don't know where north or west is, and I, you know, I feel completely lost, my bearings are shot. At least here I can see the ocean, and I know where I'm at, and, it, and it's comforting, you know. I don't think I'll ever leave. One guy's going, hey, bad guy, guy, you look good, go, hey, you know, it's the ocean, you know. It's, it, it heals, it preserves, it enlightens. Like I told my son, when I, when I, when I leave this, this, this earth, you know, I want to I want to be spread out there, you know. Places that I serve, you know. That's that's I want to go back to the ocean. In our quest for athletes taking their sports to the limit, we left Hawaii knowing that we met many of the best watermen and women in the world. From the big wave gurus to the wind-loving airmen and the paddle surfing elite. We have seen it all and gained insight into how and why so many people live their lives to be close to the limit.